Uh, good morning, members and uh, guests here at the convention. Uh, Thank you very much for having me back. It's a vote of confidence, I presume, in, in the previous presentation. Uh, and, you know, I should congratulate you on, on choosing this topic. It's something I've had a long-standing interest in, and it's hugely important. I mean, you'll have gathered by this stage that there's, you know, a very strong school of thought which really places a lot of the uh, difficulties we might see in the Irish parliamentary system on the consequences of the electoral system. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about is maybe this, this other issue that the chairman has talked about, about what goes on within parliament and how perhaps tweaking things a little bit can have quite profound effect on the, the sort of what parliament does. I mean, if we think of parliament like a factory producing things and doing things, like how can we make it better and more efficient and improve its, improve its uh, performance in relation to various things. Um, I, I sent a, a note, hopefully you've seen, I tried to keep it quite short, uh, including detailing some of the major reforms that have been proposed to give you a, a flavour of the fact that, you know, the, the idea of reforming the doll is not very new. In fact, I was looking at some stuff last night going back to the 19, 1970s, you know, 40 years ago, where there's a very similar atmosphere. There was a lot of talk about constitutional change and, and reform of parliament, that this was long overdue. Um, so this is a long-standing issue, but I think this is a fantastic opportunity. The convention can have a very powerful voice, external voice, Voice, external to Parliament in saying what might usefully, what, what trajectory uh, Dáil reform might usefully take. By way of background, uh, again, as, as the Chairman have said, I mean, within Ireland, we, we, you know, we're creeping up on, on the, you know, a century since 1919 and the first Dáil, and it's something we're very proud of. We tend to forget we've one of the longest established parliamentary, doc, uh, parliamentary democracies in, in the world. And yet, 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 consistently, there's always been this perception that um, you know, we inherited a system and it's kind of been, it's been frozen since and it's really not fit for purpose is the term, the, the common, term commonly used nowadays. Um, and this is a phrase um, that I can't remember where I found it, but it is a true phrase and it was, uh, it was spoken by um, Michael Yeats, he was one of the, he was a senator, he was one of the first members of the European Parliament. Um, once Ireland joined, he was the son of, of William Butler Yeats, and he was, he was in uh, Brussels, I presume, and he's inviting a, a delegation from New Zealand over, and they were talking about difficulties they were having with their parliament, and he said, well, you know, if you ever want to see what they were saying about how the House of, uh, you know, the, the New Zealand Parliament very much reflected uh, Westminster in 1947, because this was the period when New Zealand set up their independent parliament. And he says, oh, well, come to Ireland sometime and see how it, the House of Commons was in 1922, because nothing has changed since, you know, we, the, the uh, Free State Constitution was written. Um, but what I want to propose to you is that this, this isn't really true. Um, there's, there's quite a lot uh, has gone on, uh, which I think the convention members should be aware of uh, before they start their deliberations. Uh, again, these are the caricatures. I mean, there's some justification and understanding here that our parliament is, you know, one of the weakest, and particularly in terms of its ability to hold the executive to account. Uh, yet, yet, what that means is, is quite tricky in detail, uh, that it's a weak parliament, a puny parliament. These are, these are quotes from uh, various authors who've written on um, on, on the Oireachtas, um, that it's very poor at bringing together interests Okay, people remain very loyal to their parties. It's very hard to get cross-party agreement on issues. Um, on the other hand, people from the outside looking in going, you know what, you're very lucky in Ireland. You tend to have quite stable governments. You tend to have quite responsive governments um, in good and bad ways. Um, it, you can take decisions quite quickly. I mean, if we think even, you know, almost this time last year, the, the liquidation of Anglo-Irish Bank, that had to happen. That could be done very, very quickly. And sometimes that's very necessary and that is needed. But of course, we often hear the complaint about the use of the, the guillotine or time limitations on legislation and, and, and so on as well. So there's, there's two sides to this, of course. Um, and the whole issue about Dáil reform, and really, as we'll see in a, in a second, I mean, the, the Constitution provides that, that the House must, must reserve the right to reform itself. It depends on which side of the House you're on. And traditionally, I mean, generally speaking, parties in opposition are all in favor of big reforms, and things to open up the opportunity for them to get involved and to, to do more things in the legislature, uh, whereas governments uh, tend not to be, okay, and for a number of reasons, want to sort of maintain and hold on to control of the agenda and what goes on in, in Parliament, okay? Uh, so it's a trade-off. There's two very distinctive views about how Parliament should run. One is that the government should be allowed to expedite its business and get on with things that it's been elected to do. And on the other hand, you have the opposition saying, well, this is not democracy. We've been cut out of the process. Uh, there must be greater equilibrium between uh, the two sides of the, of the chamber, as it were, between opposition and government. 
the government is not the sole repository of wisdom. There's lots of wisdom and good ideas in the opposition and how can these feed into the policy process. Now, the last time I spoke to you last May, uh, and I don't, won't go through these all again, but just to say to you, we sort of agreed that the Constitution says, when we're speaking about the electoral system, that these are the tasks of, of Parliament. And when we're talking about uh, Dáil reform, really what we're focusing on here is, is two key tasks of Parliament. It's the production of legislation, the lawmaking function, which is kind of a, you know, a, a, a litmus test of a, of a legislature, and then oversight of the executive. I've just grouped these two together here. So it's, it's, it's you know, the financial oversight is part of oversight of, of government generally. Uh, so I'm going to focus mainly on this, this second issue here. Okay. The parameters, though, first of all, what, you know, what determines the rules, the way uh, Dáil Éireann, the lower house, works? Well, there's, there's kind of a hierarchy at the top. You have the, the Constitution, you might have heard of this. Um, you know, this is uh, what it says in the Constitution. Each house, each house shall, shall make its own rules and standing orders, okay? So that's there. As we know, the, the Constitution says nothing about political parties and the reality of sort of party competition, but it says it's the, you know, it's the job of the Shannon to make its own rules and the job of the Dáil to make their own rules, and you know, that's where it lies. Uh, at the second level then, you have the actual rule book. This is, well, about 10 years old now, the 2002 version. So there's a rule book. This is called the Standing Orders relative to public business. There's one for the Shannon and one for the Dáil. And thirdly, there's also standing orders for, for private business, but that's the Dáil and the Shannon mainly do their business in, in public. And thirdly, I don't have a copy of it, but there's a kind of a book of precedents called the Saling, Salient Rulings of the Chair, and both the Cian Corla in the Dáil and the Cahirlach in the Shannon have these. And it's a kind of, uh, um, you know, what's happened before, uh, what precedents have been set, what, what is acceptable language in Parliament, and what you can and can't do, and so on. Uh, so these are the three levels, and obviously the role of the Constitution is, is looking primarily at um, the Constitution, the first issue, but uh, hopefully over the course of the day and, and tomorrow, um, you'll have more consideration of the standing orders, because this is really, it's like any organization in the world, you need rules, and the rules determine who can speak, when they can speak, what you can do, what you can't do, and this is very, very important for what it is the, the uh, Parliament does. Now, in respect of, of lawmaking, just to go through these, um, the lawmaking function, you know, there's not, this is the numbers of pieces of primary legislation that have been produced by the Houses of the Oireachtas uh, since 1922. So over the last, what is that, 90 years, the average, okay, it, it fluctuates wildly because some years you have elections, so the parliament isn't sitting. Uh, in other years, you might have a flurry of small bits of, uh, or bits of small legislation. I mean, what this doesn't tell you is about over time, legislation has generally become more complex and, and longer. In fact, just before Christmas was one of the longest pieces of legislation in the history of the state. It was the consolidation of all the companies' acts and it took an enormous amount of time uh, to put together, but hundreds of pages long. And then you'll have other pieces which are, are very short, okay? So you're not really necessarily comparing like with like. But the red line there is the important one. And, and over time, the amount of legislation going through Parliament, um, of primary legislation, hasn't increased massively. There's a lot more, well, not a you know, there's a lot more secondary legislation, but that has tended to, to uh, fluctuate um, over time as well. Um, there is, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, you would like to see, a, I mean, if the role of, parliament, of the legislature is to produce legislation, you would expect over time that it would become more efficient, that there would be greater productivity, particularly as we'll see in the context of reforms that have happened over the last 30 years, um, the move towards more automation and modernization, that there would be more throughput of law in, in Parliament. Uh, but these are the figures. I mean, this is from the Irish Statute Book online. This is the actual acts of Parliament um, that have been, that have passed into law. There have been others proposed that don't become law. This is what's, what's actually become uh, law. Now, I don't want to say too much more about that because what I really want to focus in on, and this seems to be the, the, you know, the issue that really um, animates people when we talk about Dáil reform, it is this perception that the Irish Parliament is at one end of a spectrum, and that spectrum goes from the, the parliaments that kind of struggle to hold government to account to the other end where they maybe have, you know, their parliaments have quite a lot of ability to hold government to account to the point of stopping government in their, in their tracks if necessary. Um, now there's three principal ways, uh, and apologies if I'm covering some ground that Art might have covered um, last night. Uh, the three principal uh, mechanisms available uh, to members of parliament to hold the executive, which they have elected to account, are parliamentary questions, which are very much the lifeblood of the accountability system 
And you talk to any civil servants and you say PQs and they throw their eyes up to heaven and go, oh, don't talk to me. But there is this ability to ask a question about any aspect of our system of government, you know, through state agencies, civil service, local government, health systems. It, it's not necessarily that the question's ever asked, it's that the question can be asked. This is absolutely vital to the system of accountability at all levels uh, within the bureaucracy as well, okay? That something might be asked, so the records must be kept. There must be order, there must be um, a system in place for retrieving information. Debate, obviously, when you debate on legislation, the parliament debates on issues as they arise, and through the course of debate, questions are asked and, and statements are made. And this is, a, this is very important, this release of information into the public domain is part of the public accountability role of, of parliament. Because it's, it's absolutely vital. Parliament sits on the sort of boundary between state and society. And so this, this release of information is a very important part of our democratic process. And finally, and I know this will come up uh, later in the day, uh, particularly with uh, Mary Murphy's uh, presentation, is the, the, the committee system. There's always been committees, uh, but over the last 20 years, the, their number has expanded and they've really become institutionalised. Kind of late compared to other parliaments in Europe, it has to be said. Uh, but they're now absolutely part and parcel of the parliamentary system in Ireland, but also the accountability uh, process as well. Now, in terms of PQs, there's some interesting uh, graphics here. Um, this is the number of parliamentary questions answered, not necessarily tabled, but answered um, in the parliament from 1960 to 2012. And I remember interviewing some people, older parliamentarians about this, and they said back in the day, you know, in the, the mid 60s, pretty much everything, questions were asked in parliament and answered in parliament. The only ones that weren't were usually statistical information that you couldn't really read out, you know, there were tables and, and so on. But over time, you just see this huge, huge increase. And there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, what the state does has increased rapidly, particularly from the early 70s, uh, not just because of EU membership, but for other reasons as well. You have a lot more, and I think this is a very important uh, aspect of, of parliamentary life in Ireland, that you have full-time politicians. It wasn't that long ago that it was a bit of a struggle to get opposition parties to attend parliament on a fairly uh, regular basis to get members to, to do so. Many members had second jobs and so on and you know would, would, would show up once a week and so on. But full-time politicians asking questions. What's, there's a lot of um, other interesting dimensions to this. Of course, the introduction of freedom of information legislation, you, you would have thought would have diminished the amount of questions that was being asked because there's more information available in the public domain, but uh, or potentially available. But it's gone up, and in fact, it shot up there in, in um, that's 2012, I think, is really quite, quite striking increase. Um, but of course, what's important here is that the percentage, it's down at about 3.5, 4% of questions are actually answered in Parliament. And there is a, a difference. Uh, when they're answered and asked, asked and answered in Parliament, there's some sort of a, um, engagement, the opportunity to ask a supplementary question and so on. But the vast majority are, are written answers. And there, you know, there are still issues with them, as we've seen in the recent case of the, um, the CRC and the, the voluntary hospitals and so on, that you know, the questions were asked and maybe, maybe weren't answered. I mean, there was the famous line in the early 90s of the, uh, the Beef Tribunal where the chairman said, well, you know, if certain questions had been answered fully in Parliament, we wouldn't have had to set up this tribunal. Now, it's debatable whether that is true or not, but certainly there's a feeling that the, the, the quality of answers is, is not always um, perfect. Um, in terms of uh, debate, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. There's been a lot more, there's been an, um, a sort of extension of the amount of time for debate. There's a lot more debating goes on in Parliament, and we'll be talking about the committees um, over the course of the day as well. But suffice to say that the committees are very much part and parcel of, of parliamentary life um, nowadays. Just in terms of what has happened in terms of Dáil reform, as I said to you, the caricature has been that we inherited a system and pretty much um, very little has happened. In fact, quite a lot has happened. Now, a lot of it is sort of technical, tidying up things. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to a couple of, of the kind of the high points on the graph here. The people who, you know, in the context of the Irish Free State Constitution, you might recall that the founders of the Irish Free State were very, very conscious of what was happening in Westminster at that time, and that was the gradual dominance of the House of Commons by the Cabinet okay, in, in London. And they really tried. I mean, they made a conscious effort to move away from this. And you might recall from previous meetings of the Convention, they tried to have mechanisms in the... They did have put mechanisms in the Constitution to try and allow for the opposition to have a greater insight and say as to what it was the executive was doing. But in the context of the Civil War and the kind of the settling of the party system into a very much us versus you, these really disappeared, and that's what you're seeing here in 1926, this sort of dismantling of the original standing orders to replace it with a system which, by and large, gave government quite a lot of control over what, how, how and when Parliament will sit and what it would do. And that kind of 
pretty much stayed, as it were, for, for 50 years. Now, bear in mind, as I said, you know, that there was, um, you know, you didn't have a full-time opposition parties and so on, and there was a certain feeling that, look, that's just the way Parliament worked. But there was a very long period of, of stasis, and that's true. The state didn't grow significantly either. It didn't sort of, uh, the, the size of the, the administrative system, government departments didn't grow too much. In fact, government departments didn't change too much over this period either. Um, the, the sort of high point here, I looked into this. This was actually quite a lot of technical stuff. There was a bit of an issue about parliamentary privilege in the early 60s. So this was just reflecting some standing orders. The most important ones here are the early 70s, and more recently in the mid-90s, the Rainbow Coalition. The early 70s, there was, this was the first, um, there was an informal, it was called the, inf I don't know why it was called informal, it was the Informal Committee on Doll Reform, and it met in the early 70s, uh, and it, it was created on the back of pretty much what's happening, like I said to you here today, where there's a feeling, you know, we really need to modernise, um, particularly in the context of accession to the European Union, um, or the EC as it was, that we need to modernise our parliamentary behaviour. But people I've spoken to about this say pretty much it actually tightens the executive's control over, over parliament. Of course, this was quite a turbulent period with the context of the troubles in Northern Ireland as well at this time. So, so the government got a very, very tight control over the parliamentary agenda. 96, 97 was different. This is the Rainbow Coalition government. And it t it's tend to be the case that um, Fine Gael Labour Party governments in Ireland have been, because, you know, these are the parties that have spent so much more time in opposition, have tended to be um, more inclined to change uh, standing orders. And uh, in the context of the Rainbow Coalition, there were some, some important changes uh, to the standing orders to allow for more uh, time for debate, uh, to allow for um, more engagement of the, with, of the committees, uh, and to, for, well, for the committees to do uh, more work and so on. Um, now, this is only up to 2008, and I just want to continue the story and to say what's, what's happened since then. But I found an interesting article by a now retired lecturer from the University of Limerick called John Stapleton some time ago, and he was writing in 1976 in the context of the, the reforms in the early 70s. And he said, this is what he said, he said, well, you know, what, what the Oireachtas really needs to do is, is have more public access uh, and broadcasting of proceedings. There should be more parliamentary time. There should be a better arrangement of parliamentary time. Um, there should be a relaxation of the government monopoly in the agenda introduction of a committee system, and greater funding of parliamentary parties and resources. And I'm just putting this up because when you think about it, you know, we, again, we tend to say nothing has changed. A lot of these things have actually happened. There has been reform that should be recognized, okay? There have been changes, okay? Now, when you get into the detail of it, the one thing that there still seems to be an issue with is a general unhappiness with the, the balance of um, agenda-setting power between the government and the opposition. Uh, in, in Parliament, or in effect between government and, and the Parliament. We tend to talk about Parliament when we mean the, the, the opposition parties. Um, but it, I, I just think it's important to recognise it's not, it's not been a static picture, uh, as is often portrayed. There have been quite a lot of changes, particularly over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Now, quite recently, there have been a couple of other changes. Um, 1995, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, there is actually, a lot of people don't know this, it still exists, it's actually in the rule book that it must be created. There was the, the Committee on Procedures and Privileges created a subcommittee on Dáil Reform. That committee actually produced a report that led to the establishment of the Houses of the Rochus Commission, which is a very important body that runs the Parliament and funds the various activities in the Parliament. Um, it still exists. I think it's one of three committees in the Oireachtas that actually has, I could be wrong in this, but has a majority of opposition members on it. It's chaired by the Chief Whip. Um, but I'm not sure if what it does anymore, to be honest. I'm not sure if it has produced a report in recent times at all. Um, again, in the context of reform, there's been a lot of modernization, a lot more use of IT. Um, so the Parliament has become a much more efficient place, uh, particularly with the e-government, e-legislation initiatives. It used to be all done by hand, you know, when, when legislation was amended words were cut out and stuck on. The bills office, they weren't allowed to open the windows of the bills office in Leinster House for fear a draft would come in and blow away all the amendments, you know? So, but it's all done now, well, this is true, but now it's done by, um, it's done by uh, computer, obviously everything's recorded. So simple things, but it improves the efficiency. Um, committees have become much more active, but what's interesting about the Irish committee system, I mean, parliaments have to organize themselves somehow. And what we know is that the Irish parliament very much organizes itself around parliamentary parties. Um, not so uh, in other parliaments where committees are very important, and uh, particularly, well, in the American um, Congress, you know, people really associate themselves with, with committee membership. I think only once in Ireland have I ever seen, I got it through the, through the door like 10 years ago in Dublin, where a, a local TD put through a, just a 
hello, I'm your, I'm your TD, and I'm also a member of this committee. But there was no mention of his political party on it, who were doing very badly in the polls at that time. But it's the only time I've ever seen in Irish politics something come through the door that, that actually made a reference to the membership of a committee rather than the membership of a party. But what you'd never seen in Ireland, what you do see sometimes in Westminster, is a committee with the government majority on it, um, censuring a minister or saying, you know, the minister did, did, did something wrong. And this is, again, kind of a litmus test of, well, how mature has the committee system become when it will take on a, a minister, say, and that minister's party has a majority or his government has a majority on the committee. So, so, so party loyalty is still quite a very strong feature of, of Irish parliamentary life. Um, there have been, I just want to recognise, because again, this, the current administration since 2011 ha, uh, were conscious of this. I mean, it was in the programme for government to, to make some amendments. Um, but even some senior members of, of the government have said, you know, there have they've been very mixed results, okay? It is important to note there have been extensions of the parliamentary sitting time. Um, there have been changes to the, the uh, parliamentary questions. So, for example, there's, there's um, more leaders' questions, I think. Uh, sorry, I forget the detail now, even though I read over these last night. But there have been changes. There's a very important change last year to the, e to the standing orders in respect of EU business. Again, this is always thrown out in the media that oh, Parliament is completely unable to deal with EU affairs. But actually, when you look into it, look into the detail, there have been some improvements there. The standing orders now say that the Irish government must come before the House and say what the priorities are for the government at every EU presidency, so every six months. I mean, this is, this is very important. This is very important. And you never hear this, there was no mention of this in the media when it actually happened. And there's greater regulation of the legislative timetable. So it's not a case of one bill being, being necessarily produced just after the other and, and the opposition having to react quickly to it. There's going to be much, uh, well, allegedly, there's going to be much uh, greater planning. Sorry, I'm coming to the end in, ca in case you're worried there. Um, and of course, in the context of the Shannon referendum, there was talk about much greater pre-legislative scrutiny and post-legislative scrutiny as well. So there are some very good ideas floating around, and some of them have been implemented. Some seem to have worked better than others, but it, it needs to be recognised if we're going to have the, a, a proper debate about it. I mean, this, this, I just don't want it to resolve into a caricature of just government controls everything, the opposition get nothing. Think, things have moved uh, quite a bit uh, from that. Okay, so by way of conclusion, it is very hard to escape the constitutional provision that says the House must organise itself. I mean, what, what, what are you going to do? You know, what, what referendum, what wording would you put in in a referendum to change that? I mean, maybe Leah could come up with something. Not to put pressure on you. Um, there is no doubt, you know, there have been reforms, but, but certainly the balance of control is very, very much with, with the government. And it probably, if we think of it on a spectrum, it probably is still weighted too much in favour, okay, of, of the government compared to other parliamentary systems. There's no perfect point in this, by the way, and you know, it needs to be recognised as well that in some systems where the opposition have a lot of opportunity to stop the government in its track, you can really, things really grind to a halt, and that brings its own problems as well. There is a role for responsible opposition, just as there is a, a role for responsible government, okay? Opposition should not be just about trying to stop government for the sake of it, okay? It's this idea of adding and contributing to better quality policy making and legislation in, in the country. Um, so the convention, I think the, the, one of the great things the convention can do is to provide a very powerful external voice. It's very hard to reform parliament from within it. I remember asking the late Gareth Fitzgerald about this, and he says it's because it goes to the heart of everything. He says, you know, parliamentary reform is, is key to everything in our political system. Um, but the convention, this, the very existence of this convention and the fact you've chosen this issue, I think, is, is going to be really significant in terms of providing a, a, um, a platform for further changes to, to occur. Um, there are a couple of challenges. There's the whole issue of the efficiency, the absolute right, and governments do have a right to proceed to implement their program for government and their legislation, versus the right of the opposition parties to have democratic debate and to challenge what it is government is proposing to do. I don't want to get into this too much, but there is also the issue about quantity versus quality. You can have a lot more debate, but is it really adding anything? You know, is there quality debate, better quality um, inputs? Um, the resources available to parliamentarians have expanded quite a lot. There's a lot of researchers in Leinster House, and I, you know, as someone who's been looking at this over years, I do think the quality of inputs has definitely increased. There's a lot more good, high-quality information being provided by the Heads of the Oireachtas Research and Library Services as well. So the standard is going up, but you know, you got to, you got to keep pushing it. It's got to, it should be the best, you know. Um, and there is, not to complicate things too much, but we should be cognizant of the fact that there is a changing environment. I'm not sure what's going to happen with the Senate, but what happens with the Senate reforms is going to have an influence on the Dáil reforms. 
there's wider changes going on about accountability in the, in the administrative system as well. Um, issues to do with how civil servants are going to appear before Rockless committees as well. So it's not, you know, you can't just focus on doll reform alone and not be cognizant of the wider environment in which the doll operates. The, I like to think of doll Aaron as kind of as the apex of accountability systems. But when you go back 30, 40 years, there weren't as many ombudsmen, there weren't as many regulators, there weren't as many opportunities um, for people to investigate different aspects of the administrative system as there are today. The doll is not the only forum uh, to do this anymore. So that's important as well. Okay, I hope I have started your deliberations well for you and that this contributes to your debate. So thank you very much, Chairman. Sorry if I've run over. Okay. Thank you.